World History In every corner of the world, you'll find pieces of history that give us revealing insights into events that were once somebody's present day news. In this video, we'll be exploring the interesting world history iceberg. We'll be covering a variety of topics ranging from disappearances of ancient civilizations to secret mind control experiments during times of war. With that in mind, let's begin with our first entry. During the Battle of Leyte Gulf in 1944, the largest naval battle of World War II, Admiral Chester Nimitz relayed an encrypted message to Admiral William Halsey Jr. containing an additional phrase, the world wonders. This crucial battle was part of the Allied strategy to isolate Japan by seizing Leyte and cutting off its vital access to oil supplies in Southeast Asia. The Imperial Japanese Navy devised a strategic plan employing decoy forces to divert attention from their main attack. Unfortunately, Admiral Halsey fell for the Japanese ruse, diverting his attention to chase the after the decoy carriers, leaving the landing beaches exposed and vulnerable. As the Japanese battleship group approached the landing forces, Admiral Thomas C. Kincaid sent a desperate plea for immediate support. Upon receiving Kinkad's message, Nimitz inquired about the location of Task Force 34 from Halsey. The encrypted message intended for Halsey included the seemingly irrelevant phrase, the world wonders, as a security measure. However, due to failure and proper deletion of padding phrases, Halsey mistakenly interpreted this phase as a critical remark directed at him. This misunderstanding significantly impacted his decision making, causing a delay in response to aid the threatened forces off Samar influencing the battle's course during a critical time in the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Archimedes, an important polymath born around 287 BCE, showed incredible creativity during the Roman siege of Cyprus in 215 BCE. Known for his math and geometry work, he also designed powerful war machines important for defending Cyprus against the Romans. One of his most famous inventions, the Archimedes Claw, was a big device with hooks and weights, and was placed on city walls to physically grab and overturn Roman ships. Though its history is debated, experiments suggest it could have worked, possibly helping Cyprus resist the Romans as mentioned by historians like Polybius, Livy, and Plutarch. Another mysterious creation attributed to Archimedes is the Archimedes Death Ray, reportedly using polished shields to focus sunlight and set Roman ships on fire. Despite being legendary, efforts to recreate this device have not produced clear results, keeping its mystery alive. The debate over whether the Vikings discovered America involves exploring various historical perspectives and definitions. The conventional idea of discovery often disregards the fact that indigenous communities had long inhabited the continent, challenging the traditional view. Some historians suggest that hunters from Asia, potentially the earliest inhabitants, reached Alaska during the last ice age, either by foot across a land bridge or by boat along the coast, becoming Native Americans. When considering non-Native American interactions, the possibility emerges that Polynesians might have arrived in America before the Vikings. Genetic studies of the sweet potato hint at early Polynesian connections with South America, but it's unclear if this happened before Viking visits. The discussion then shifts to whether the Vikings or Columbus were the first Europeans to enter America. The Viking exploration of Vinland around 1000 gained credibility in 1960 when archaeologists found a Viking settlement at Lance Ox Meadows in Newfoundland. While the Vikings didn't technically discover America, given prior indigenous presence, they did precede Columbus by approximately 500 years, challenging the Eurocentric view and revealing the intricate history of encounters and exploration in the Americas. The demise of the Library of Alexandria, an ancient repository of knowledge, remains shrouded in mystery. Founded in 283 BC in Egypt by Ptolemy I Soter, the library thrived as a hub of learning, housing an estimated half a million documents at its zenith. One theory points to Julius Caesar's potential role in his destruction, which is the main theory. During a conflict in Alexandria in 48 BC, Caesar ordered the burning of his own ships to combat his enemy, which is believed to have ignited the library's vicinity, though his accounts lack explicit mention of the library's fate. Another narrative implicates Christian figures Theopolis and Cyril in its decline. The conversion of the Temple of Therapis into a Christian church around 391 AD likely led to document destruction, exaggerated by riots. Additionally, Caliph Omar is linked to the library's downfall and the Muslim conquest in 640 AD, allegedly dismissing its collection as heretical and ended up ordering its use as fuel for bathhouses over six months, yet contemporary evidence is lacking. Identifying the true culprit is hard due to biased historical records. Figures like Caesar, Theopolis, Cyril, and Omar have been implicated each with their own motivations and documented biases. The tragedy, however, lies not just in the uncertainty of blame, but in the irreversible loss of an extensive wealth of ancient knowledge 
signifying the end of an era. The Silk Road, renowned for connecting the East and the West, was a vast trade network fostering the exchange of goods, ideas, and culture. Often associated with the Han Dynasty, its roots trace back to the Royal Road established about 300 years earlier by Persian ruler Darius I in the Archimand Empire. This precursor path linked Susa to Sardis, eventually becoming part of the expanded Silk Road thanks to Alexander the Great. Formalizing trade routes in the 1st and 2nd centuries BC, the Silk Road connected the Roman Empire, the Kushan Empire in northern India, and various territories in between. Coined by German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen in 1877, it comprised trading posts, markets, and routes spanning from Antioch to China. Ports along the Persian Gulf facilitated transportation to the Mediterranean, affecting cities in the Roman Empire in Europe. Contrary to its name, the Silk Road traded diverse commodities like fruits, livestock, metals, and artwork. It facilitated the exchange of language, culture, and innovations such as paper and gunpowder. Paper, invented during the Han Dynasty, reached Europe around 780, revolutionizing mass communication. Additionally, the Silk Road played a crucial role in disseminating spices, glassmaking techniques, and gunpowder, impacting culinary practices, technology, and warfare. The Warwolf, also known as Warwolf or Loup de Guerre, is believed to be the biggest tribute ever made. King Edward I of England ordered it during the Siege of Stirling Castle in the Scottish Wards of Independence. This immense siege machine, built in Scotland, filled 30 wagons when taken apart and required 5 master carpenters and 49 workers over 3 months. Its mere presence made the Scottish defenders consider surrender because they feared its destructive power. However, King Edward I persisted in the siege to show off the trebuchet's strength. Called a fearful engine, the werewolf could accurately throw rocks weighing up to 135 kilograms across 200 meters, capable of bringing down parts of the castle's walls. Its psychological impact was significant, with Scottish soldiers thinking about surrender even before seeing its full abilities. This historic siege engine showcased the strategic warfare tactics used during medieval times. Born in 524 BC, Themistocles played a vital role in Greek politics, notably during the greco persian Wars. Rising from a non-privileged background, he aligned with public sentiment, conflicting with influential nobles. Elected Archon in 493 BC, he held a significant position for 15 years, successfully sidelining rivals Artistes and Exanthippus. Recognizing the Persian danger, Themistocles advocated for Athens and Greek naval strength. He expanded Piraeus and built walls, linking it to the city. Despite the triumph at Marathon in 483 BC, Themistocles urged Athens to increase its fleet to 200 ships, guided by a Delphic oracle. In 480 BC, facing Xerxes' Persian invasion, Themistocles' faith in naval power was tested. While the Persian army moved overland, the Greek navy, led by Themistocles, confronted them at Artemisium. Persuading the Greeks to stand firm at Salamis despite being outnumbered, he orchestrated a decisive naval victory. Themistocles' strategy gained Athenian trust, supporting fleet expansion and even considering abandoning Athens based on his evaluations. The Battle of Adwa, fought on March 1, 1896 near Adwa in north-central Ethiopia, stands as a pivotal point in African colonial history. Emperor Menelik II led the Ethiopian army to a definite triumph over Italian forces, thwarting Italy's aspirations in Africa and marking the first substantial defeat of a European power by African forces in the colonial era. The conflict stemmed from disagreements over the Treaty of Wuchale, leading Menelik to reject it in 1893 and brace for potential Italian military dominance. Despite initial Italian successes, Menelik strategically portrayed his military strength as weak. The battle on March 1, 1896 revealed the actual true might of the Ethiopian army. Confronted with challenges like shortages, disorganization, and a well-prepped Ethiopian force, the Italians suffered heavy losses with over 6,000 casualties and numerous prisoners. Malik's triumph resulted in the Treaty of Addis Ababa in October 1896, annulling the Treaty of Wachale and establishing Ethiopia's borders through subsequent agreements with European powers. This event remains a momentous episode in African history symbolizing resistance against European colonization. Constructed around 1850 BCE during Pharaoh Senseret III's reign, the ancient Suez Canal stands as a remarkable engineering feat in ancient times, revolutionizing trade and transport in ancient Egypt. This canal connected the Red Sea to the Nile River, creating a direct route between the Mediterranean and Red Seas. Engineered to overcome natural obstacles, it streamlined maritime navigation, simplifying the movement of goods and reducing land-based journeys. The ancient Suez Canal also linked key trade centers of the Mediterranean and Red Sea, 
becoming a crucial conduit for transferring commodities such as copper, ivory, and precious stones. Its strategic position enabled Egypt to manage and expand its trade connections. The canal eventually fell into disuse during the Roman period. Goals for over a thousand years, the canal was revived in 1869 with the establishment of the modern Suez Canal, reinstating a direct maritime passage. Although the ancient Suez Canal lacks the global impact of its modern counterpart, its historical importance highlights ancient Egyptians' inventive prowess and advanced engineering. In the 6th century BC, Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt sponsored an expedition aiming to circumnavigate Africa, as chronicled by Herodotus. Between 610 to 595 BC, Adept Phoenician sailors embarked from the Red Sea, navigating the Southern Ocean and even pausing in Libya to cultivate crops. After a two-year journey, they supposedly sailed past the Pillars of Hercules and returned to Egypt. Herodotus mentioned an intriguing detail, the sun positioned on their right, suggesting a clockwise voyage. Despite Herodotus' skepticism and the lack of specific names and details, the sun's alignment became crucial evidence supporting the expedition. Despite criticisms and the absence of later voyages replicating this claimed circumnavigation, the intriguing sun detail implies that an ancient attempt to circumnavigate Africa could actually have been possible. The skepticism of later geographers and the dismissal of such knowledge doesn't necessarily invalidate the potential historical accuracy of this ambitious expedition. The Antikythera mechanism, an ancient Greek device found near Antikythera in 1901 from a sunken trading ship, has fascinated scholars. Crafted circa 100 BCE, the purpose of this ancient device puzzled researchers for years. Initially thought to be a clock or a calendar, its function remained elusive until Princeton scientist Derek Sala Price provided a breakthrough analysis in 1959. Price determined that the mechanism predicted planetary and stellar positions based on the calendar month, acting as an astronomical clock. The Antikythera mechanism functioned as sort of an analog computer, utilizing gear ratios to perform intricate calculations. Its purpose extended beyond astronomy though, encompassing various functions such as predicting celestial movements, eclipses, lunar and solar calendars, and even a countdown for sporting events in ancient Greece. Advancements in technology, including modern x-ray and 3D mapping, have allowed scientists to unravel more of its secrets. Despite these revelations, mysteries persist regarding its creators, purpose, and the incredible engineering behind its construction. Soviet Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov played a pivotal role in preventing a potential nuclear disaster during the Cold War. In 1983, following the downing of Korean Airlines Flight 007 by the Soviet military, Petrov was on duty at the Oko Nuclear Early Warning System Command Center. The system indicated a missile launch from the US and more to follow. Despite the tense situation, Petrov, suspecting a false alarm, chose to wait for confirmation, departing from the Soviet military procedure. His decision proved correct, preventing a disastrous retaliatory nuclear strike on the US and NATO allies. An investigation later revealed a malfunction in the Soviet satellite warning system. Although initially praised, Petrov received no official recognition and faced reprimands for his administrative efforts. This incident highlighted flaws in the Soviet early warning system. Petrov's judgment was influenced by doubts about the system's reliability, the verification process, and the lack of supporting evidence. Despite his crucial role, he did not receive official recognition, was reassigned, and eventually retired after experiencing a nervous breakdown. The incident became public knowledge in 1998 when General Yuri Votintsev, the first recipient of Petrov's report, disclosed it. Greek fire, an ancient and devastating flammable weapon, made its debut in Byzantine warfare around 678 BCE. Revered as the napalm of ancient warfare, it remained a closely guarded state secret for over seven centuries, with its creation attributed to Callinicus. Although the exact recipe remains a mystery, it supposedly consisted of light petroleum or naphtha, quicklime, sulfur, resin, potassium nitrate, and potentially gunpowder. Crafting the highly flammable liquid was a perilous task, demanding advanced technology. Initially used in naval conflicts, the weapon unleashed flaming liquid under pressure onto enemy ships. The Dromon, a fast sailing vessel, served as a carrier, armed with a sophisticated firing device including bronze tubes, a siphon pump, and a swiveling nozzle. Greek fire's devastating effects instilled terror, setting fire to ships' rigging, sails, and even hulls. Its exceptional ability to burn on water made defense against it nearly impossible. Against Arab invasion in the late 7th century, Greek fire played a crucial role, repelling besieging enemy fleets and significantly contributing to the defense and victories of the Byzantine Empire. Though not employed after the Fourth Crusade, Greek fire persisted as one of the most formidable weapons in global warfare. 
The Kwasi War from 1798 to 1800 was a conflict primarily between the United States and France, sparked by the XYZ affair where French agents sought bribes from American diplomats. President John Adams responded by suspending treaties leading to an undeclared naval conflict with French pioneers. Naval skirmishes occurred in the Caribbean and the Atlantic, earning the conflict its quasi label due to its undeclared nature. The Convention of 1800, also known as the Treaty of Mortefontaine, concluded hostiles, normalized relations, and annealed the 1778 Treaty of Alliance with France. In contrast, the Barbary Wars originate from piracy by North African states against American and European ships in the Mediterranean. The First Barbary War, from 1801 to 1805, began when the Pasha of Tripoli, a title given to the rulers which were under the Ottomans, declared war on the United States. This caused the US Navy, notably the USS Constitution, to engage in naval operations, including the Battle of Derna. In 1805, a peace treaty was established with Tripoli. The Second Barbie War took place during the War of 1812. The United States resumed efforts to end piracy after the war, engaging with Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, which were North African pirate states under the Ottoman Empire. The Battle of Algiers in 1815 eventually compelled the rulers of Algiers to sign treaties, ending tribute payments, and securing the release of American prisoners. Kirishitan, derived from the Portuguese Krasito, meaning Christian, holds historical significance in 16th and 17th century Japan representing Japanese Christians influenced by Roman Catholic missionaries like Francis Javier in 1549. Jesuits and later Franciscans, which are religious orders within the Catholic Church, converted a substantial number, possibly half a million, coincided with Portuguese traders entering Japan. Initially supported by Oda Nobunaga, the Japanese daimyo at the time, Kirishitan challenged the political dominance of Buddhism. However, the preceding daimyo, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's skepticism, led to the expulsion of foreign missionaries in 1587, intensifying under Tokugawa Iyasu, the shogun's rule. By 1614, Kirishitan was officially banned, marking severe prosecution. No one Kirishitan had either been executed or exiled by 1650, leading to the emergence of Kakur Kirishitan, a secret movement mainly in western Kyushu. For over two centuries, Kakur Kirishitan survived in secrecy, practicing their faith underground. When the prohibition eased in the mid-19th century, European priests initially found no Japanese Christians. However, in 1865, a Roman Catholic church was established, leading 20,000 Kakur Christians to openly come out and profess their faith. With Emperor Meiji's transforms, Christian gained the right to declare their faith and worship publicly. Around 14,000 embraced Roman Catholicism, while a significant portion retained non-Christian elements, becoming Hanare Christian or separate Christians. The Battle of Toulouse in 721 was a crucial conflict between Odo the Great, Duke of Aquitaine, and an Umayyad Muslim force led by al saman ibn Malik al khwarizmi Aquitaine was a region near the southwestern corner of Fads, while the Umayyads were the first Muslim dynasty. The Umayyads aimed to expand their control westward from Narbonne into Aquitaine, seeking dominance over the region. al khwarizmi assembled an army intending to conquer the Garnan River Valley and capture Toulouse, a significant city in Aquitaine. While surrounding Toulouse, Oro, who had left the city seeking aid, returned after three months with troops from Aquitaine, Gascony, and potentially Frankish soldiers. The Mayad army, despite its strength, became overconfident and neglected strong defenses around their camp. When Oro attacked on June 9th, the Mayad forces were caught off guard. The battle resulted in a resounding victory for Oro, as the surprised Umayyad scattered, with conflicting accounts regarding the number of casualties. Although some Umayyad soldiers managed to escape, al Khawailaini died during the battle. This battle significantly impacted the Umayyad expansion plans. It halted their progress northwards, temporarily preventing their ambition to conquer further into Europe. If Odo would have lost, the Muslim army would have conquered over France and Germany and potentially turned entire Europe into Muslim. The victory earned Odo widespread recognition in Aquitaine and beyond, with him being praised as a champion of Christianity by the Pope in Rome. Viking settlements and trade routes in England, Ireland, and Russia are well documented, but their Mediterranean expeditions are less clear. In 1859, Viking commander Bjorn Ironside led a raiding voyage, potentially aiming to sack Rome. This raid ventured through Muslim-controlled Spain, France, and Italy. In the late 700s, Vikings overran near Montior, an island in France, and intensified attacks on the French mainland, reaching as far as Paris in 845. The King of France, Charles the Bald, paid Vikings to leave, and they gradually gained a foothold in northwest France, particularly in Normandy, likely fueling interest in the Mediterranean. Bjorn Ironside's 859 Mediterranean voyage, also led by Hastein, involved sacking towns in modern Portugal, 
passing through the Strait of Gibraltar and sacking towns in Spanish and the Bulric Islands. In 860, they reached Italy, mistakenly eluding Luni near La Spezia, thinking it was Rome. Upon realizing their mistake, they simply departed for home. The Ottoman raid on Iceland in 1627, known as the Turkish Abduction, involved slave raids by pirates from northwest Africa, particularly Argiers and Saleh, which were tied to the Ottoman Empire. Targets included regions of Grindavik, the East Fjords, and Vesta Manager, resulting in about 50 deaths and nearly 400 individuals captured and sold into slavery. A ransom was paid, 9 to 18 years later, for the return of some captives. The term Turkish here refers generally to Muslims of the Mediterranean, many subjects of the Ottoman Empire with the Barbary pirates conducting the raid. Led by Murat Reis from Saleh, the first group targeted Grindavik and attempted to raid Besavitoire, facing local resistance. The second group from Algiers looted the East Fjords and attacked Vestmanager, resulting in 34 deaths and 234 captives. Taken to Algiers, some were chosen by the city-state commander and the rest were sold in the slave market. Many captives died from illness and around 100 individuals converted to Islam. Ransom payments facilitated the return of some captives with Minister Olaf Agilusson from Vesmani Yajur involved in fundraising. This raid is primarily known for the long distance the pirates would have covered to unleash the raid. The story of Abu Bakr II's alleged journey to the Americas before European explorers as shared by Mansa Musa during his 1324 Hajj pilgrimage lacks substantial historical evidence. According to the tale, Abu Bakr II, who was Mansa Musa's predecessor, left the Mali Empire's throne and embarked on a grand expedition across the Atlantic with a large fleet. However, upon departure, he never returned, and Mansa Musa claimed the throne. This account faces historical challenges, with the Mali Empire's official genealogy not prominently featuring Abu Bakr II, mentioning him solely as a relative of the empire's founder. Some attribute the confusion to potential mistranslations in texts from Arab historians. Revolutionist historians such as Ivan van Tsertema and Gauso Divara advocate for the theory of pre-European African voyages to the Americas though. Van Tsertema's thesis relies on oral traditions from Gritios, which were oral historians of West Africa, suggesting that Abu Bakr II set sail in 1311. Diwara posits that Gritios might have omitted the expedition due to the perceived abandonment of responsibilities. There are claims that Abu Bakr II established a colony in Brazil called Born Banamuk, engaged in trade with the Tupi people, and sent riches back to Mali. However, evidence supporting these assertions is vague. Amid the complexities of leading a country and handling international affairs, British Prime Minister Anthony Aden faced significant challenges due to lack of sleep and sickness, which strongly influenced important decisions during a crucial post-World War II period. Aden's time as Prime Minister was marked by intense events notably the 1959 Suez Crisis. His declining health, marked by troubled sleeping, which is known to affect thinking and decision making, was made worse by demanding nature of his job and the intense focus on global affairs. Ultimately, Eden's health problems led to him resigning in 1957, showing how much physical and mental health can affect how well a leader performs. This connection between health issues and making important decisions shows how personal well-being can influence big events in history. The Conway Cabal arose from dissatisfaction among some American officers with George Washington's leadership during the Revolutionary War. Conway, a French-Irish soldier, played a key role by expressing doubts about Washington's military skills to officers like General Horito Gates. They criticized Washington for what they saw as poor management of the war effort, aiming to challenge his command in the army. Historians debate the Cabal's real extent and its structure though, with some questioning if it was a formal plot. The tension heightened when a letter from Conway criticizing Washington was intercepted, causing friction among the officers. Despite feeling hurt, Washington kept his composure and leadership intact. The Conway cabal ultimately failed to oust Washington from command and Conway's reputation suffered, leading to his resignation. This event showcased the fragile unity within the contentional army, highlighting Washington's role in keeping together a dissatisfied group of officers. In the broader context of the Revolutionary War, the Conway Cabal signifies internal struggles during the fight for independence. The Elamites, an ancient civilization, inhabited the region known as Elam, located in what is now southwestern Iran. Flourishing from around 3200 to 539 BC, the Elamites played a significant role in the broader context of the ancient Near East, interacting with other powerful civilizations like Mesopotamia. However, even though they were one of the earliest civilizations and existed for over 2000 years, not much is known about them as compared to other well-known civilizations, with knowledge being primarily from Mesopotamian sources. 
The Elamite civilization was characterized by a diverse landscape, including lowlands, highlands, and plains, contributing to the development of a varied and adaptable culture. The Elamites are known to have spoken a language isolate, meaning it is not clearly related to any other known language, and they created their own distinct writing system. One of the major Elamite cities was Susa, an important political and economic center. Susa's strategic location near the Persian Gulf contributed to its prosperity and its role as a hub for trade and culture exchange. Eventually, the region fell under control of the Persian Empire, marking the end of Elamite autonomy. Emperor Heraclius, a pivotal figure in Byzantine history, governed from 610 to 641 CE, facing formidable challenges during a tumultuous period. His reign commenced amid external threats from the Sassanian Empire and the emerging Islamic Caliphate. The Byzantine Sassanian War, ranging from 602 to 628, marked by initial losses, saw Heraclius' strategic brilliance in a daring counteroffensive. The decisive battle of Ninveh in 627 shifted the conflict's course. However, his rule faced another turning point with the rise of the Islamic Caliphate leading to the Byzantine Arab Wars from 634 to 750. The Battle of Yomurk in 636 and subsequent events resulted in significant territorial loss for the Byzantines. Beyond military challenges, Heraclius has grappled with internal issues, including financial struggles, religious controversies, and succession disputes. The rise of monothelitheism and Heraclius' incestuous marriage to his niece Martina fuel tensions and divine displeasure rumors. Heraclius' later years were marked by declining health and criticism for internal affairs. He passed away in 641, leaving a complex legacy behind. Urartu, or the Kingdom of Urartu, thrived in the Armenian highland from the 9th to 6th century BCE. The historical challenges faces challenges due to limited written records and potential biases from enemies like Syria, so a lot of it is still a mystery. Despite that, it encompassed parts of modern Armenia, eastern Turkey, and northwestern Iran, emerging as a significant political and military force in the ancient Near East during a transformative period. Originating in the Iron Age, Urartu rose to prominence coinciding with the Assyrian Empire's decline. The Urartians, of unknown ethnicity and language, established a powerful kingdom with its capital at Tushpa, modern-day Turkey. Reaching its zenith during the 9th and 8th century BCE under kings like Sarduri I and Argisti I, what makes them stand out is their advanced architecture seen in fortresses, temples, and irrigation systems, represented by the fortress of Van overlooking Lake Van. These fortifications served both defensive and administrative purposes, highlighting the strategic awareness of Urartian rulers. The Kingdom of Urartu exchanged an extensive trade, military campaigns, and diplomatic relations, developing a unique writing system known as Urartian Coniform, providing insights into the language and culture. However, its downfall began in the late 8th century BCE as the expanding Assyrian Empire applied military pressure. This theory states that Polynesians and Native Americans may have made contact 800 years ago challenging established narratives of the trans-Pacific travel. A nature study analyzed genes from modern Pacific and South American populations, revealing that around 12,000 AD, voyages between Polynesia and the Americans resulted in a genetic mix in the South Marquesas archipelago. The study suggests either South Americans reached East Polynesia or Polynesians sailed to the Americas before settling in the Marquesas. The Native American genetic signature found in Polynesia indicates a common source from coastal Ecuador and Colombia, challenging previous theories of post-European contact. If Native Americans reached remote islands by 12,000, drifting on winds and currents probably played a role. The genetic evidence may support Polynesians sailing to Americas challenging the tradition view that Native Americans settled Polynesian islands. The study also sheds light on Easter Island's history, revealing admixture between Native Americans and Polynesians around 1380, complicating the understanding of the island settlement. The Allied intervention in Russia post-World War I from 1918 to 1922 was a complex series of military expeditions supporting the White Army against the Bolshevik Red Army during the Russian Civil War. Nations like the United States, the United Kingdom, and France were involved in this intervention driven by varied motivations including curbing communism and safeguarding economic interests. The Allies provided military forces and logistical aid to the White Army in places like Arkhangelsk and Vladivostok. Challenges such as a lack of unified strategy, conflicting objectives, and harsh weather hampered the intervention. The absence of coordination and war weariness among the Western powers led to a gradual withdrawal of foreign forces by 1922. Despite these efforts, the intervention failed to prevent the Bolsheviks' triumph in the Russian Civil War resulting in their consolidation of control over the Soviet Union. This historical episode is debated and criticized, with critics arguing that it exacerbated the conflict, contributing to the suffering of the Russian people, and strained relations between the Western powers and the Soviet government for years. 
Believe it or not, the Assassin's Creed video game franchise draws inspiration from the historical phenomenon of the Nizari Ismaili, a Shia Muslim faction forming the Order of Assassins in the late 11th to mid 13th centuries. Faced with challenges as a religious minority against foes like the Seljuk Empire and Crusaders, the Assassins employed asymmetrical warfare, emphasizing targeted assassins over traditional battles. The strategic approach aimed to relieve pressure from superior surrounding forces by eliminating enemy leaders. Operating out of necessity for survival, the Assassins, also known as the Nazari Ismailis, focused on self-defense and protecting their community rather than pursuing power. Their actions were characterized by effective timing and coordination during attacks, with historical accounts highlighting their success in eliminating significant figures like Crusader leader Conrad of Montferrat. Their ability to blend in, patiently infiltrate enemy entourages, and strategically plan attacks contribute to their effectiveness. The downfall of the Nazari Ismailis occurred in the mid-13th century when facing the Mongols, known for their relentless tactics. The Mongols swiftly dismantled Nazari Ismaili strongholds leading to the fall of Alamut in 1256 CE. The Yamnaya culture, existing in the late Copper Age to early Bronze Age across present-day Ukraine, Russia, and parts of Western Asia, was known for its nomadic lifestyle. They practiced distinct burials called kurgans, featuring mounds and single graves containing various valuable items suggesting a structured society. However, what makes them so interesting is that they greatly influenced the genes and culture of Europe and parts of Asia. Around 3000 BCE, during the Yamna Horizon period, their migration spread Indo-European languages, shaping the diverse cultures and languages of Europe and Asia that we know today. Additionally, genetic research highlights their significant impact on the ancestry of modern European and South Asian populations, especially those from the Bronze Age era. However, despite ongoing studies, many aspects of the Yamnya culture remain a subject of exploration, meaning there's still mysteries to them unexplored. The Syrian and Greek genocides occurring during different periods and in separate regions share the tragic similarity of systematic violence and atrocities. The Syrian genocide, or Seifo, took place during World War I as part of the Ottoman Empire's broader systematic extermination of minorities. The Ottomans targeted Assyrians across present-day Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. This genocide involved mass killings, forced deportations, and other violent acts orchestrated by the Ottoman government. Similarly, the Greek genocide or Pontic genocide happened during and after World War I under the Young Turks' regime. It aimed to eradicate Greeks from areas like Pontus, Anatolia, and East Antares, employing mass killings, forced deportations, and violence. These atrocities included massacres, forced labor, and deportations. Roughly 250,000 to 500,000 Assyrians and around 350,000 Greeks lost their lives during the Ottoman Christian Genocide, with many forcibly displaced. Ongoing research, remembrance, and advocacy efforts surround both genocides, as recognition remains a complex and sensitive matter. Several nations and organizations officially acknowledge these events as genocides, highlighting the importance of acknowledging and remembering this historical injustice. The Irish Potato Famine, spanning the mid-19th century, marked a devastating period in Irish history characterized by widespread hunger, disease, and mass emigration. Triggered by the potato blight caused by the fungus Phytophthora infestans, the famine's impact was intensified by socioeconomic political factors, particularly British policies. Discriminatory measures against Irish Catholics, restricting their career opportunities and land acquisitions, forced many to rent small parcels from British Protestant absentee landowners. In 1845, half of these lots were less than 5 acres, limiting the ability to grow sufficient potatoes, which were stable for approximately half of Ireland's population. British administration, accused of discouraging charitable donations and exporting grain and livestock despite the crisis, further fueled resentment. Over the following decade, more than 750,000 Irish perished and another 2 million emigrated to Great Britain, Canada and the United States. The Irish potato famine left a lasting legacy of bitterness and distrust toward the British, as many believed it was not slowly a natural disaster but a consequence of British colonial policies. The Great Famine of Europe happened in the early 14th century from about 1315 to 1317, and it was a tragic event marked by widespread food shortages, famine, and societal disruption. The main cause was a series of unusual weather conditions starting in 1315, leading to continuous heavy rainfall and widespread crop failures, particularly affecting crops like wheat, oats, and barley. This resulted in skyrocketing food prices, scarcity, and widespread hunger. The impacts of the failed harvests were severe, sparking social and economic consequences. The scarcity of essential foods led to extreme measures like documented instances of cannibalism. The socioeconomic effects were profound, causing escalated food costs, stagnant wages, and increased social unrest. 
peasant revolts became more common as the lower classes, already burdened by feudal obligations, sought relief. Government struggled to cope and the crisis challenged the established social structure. The aftermath influenced demographic, societal conflicts, and perceptions of medieval governments. The authority of the church also declined as people attributed disasters to divine punishment. Wilhelm Canaris, a significant figure in German military intelligence during the lead-up to and throughout World War II, played a complex role in the Nazi regime. Born on January 1, 1887, in Aplerbeck, Germany, Canaris climbed the naval ranks, eventually becoming an admiral. As head of the Abwehr, the German military intelligence service, he initially supported Hitler but had doubts about the regime's aggressive policies and atrocities. Canaris, along with other anti-Hitler figures in the German military, got involved in resistance activities, including Operation Valkyr, a plot to assassinate Hitler. Despite the failed attempt on July 20, 1944, Canaris continued resisting the regime, supporting those persecuted by the Nazis. His pessimistic views on the Eastern Front and resistance involvement led to a loss of trust by Hitler, and in 1944, he was removed from his position. Canaris, along with other resistance members, faced arrest and execution after the failed plot. He met his fate at Florissenburg concentration camp on April 9, 1945. Willem Canaris' complex legacy reflects internal dissent within Germany during the Nazi era. While serving the regime officially, his later opposition underscored a moral stance against Nazi atrocities even at a great personal risk. The Mongol conquest of the 13th century led by figures like Genghis Khan caused extensive destruction across Eurasia. The Mongol army, known for brutality, conquered cities and villages, resulting in deaths of millions. The conquest led to the loss of approximately 11% of the world's population at the time, around 37.75 to 60 million individuals. The Mongols used brutal military tactics, engaging in mass indiscriminate murder as a form of collective punishment. The invasion caused significant demographic changes in Asia. Cities faced mass extermination, leading to a drastic decline in population. China, in particular, experienced a substantial drop from around 120 million inhabitants before the invasion to approximately 60 million after. The Mongols used psychological warfare, executing peasants at random in surrendered villages and obliterating towns for any act of resistance. The invasions caused extensive destruction in cities across Eurasia, including the burning of libraries, books, and hospitals during the siege of Baghdad in 1258. Genghis Khan engaged in religious warfare, deliberately destroying places of worship. The destruction of irrigation systems in Iran and Iraq had long-lasting effects on agriculture and led to food shortages. Mongols employed tactics like burning farmland, diverting rivers, and capillating diseased crops during sieges. The alleged theory of the spread of the Black Death to Europe during the Mongol siege of Kaffa exemplifies the devastating consequences of these tactics. Mutilation was a harsh and somewhat common practice during the peak of the Byzantine Empire, particularly from about 600 AD to 1000 AD. This tradition, prevalent in the early stages of the empire, mainly targeted expelled emperors, or those seen as rivals for the throne. The idea behind such mutilations was deeply rooted in Byzantine belief about the physical traits of rulers. There was a widespread belief that a person with physical imperfections couldn't effectively rule as an emperor. When an emperor was overthrown, the common practice was to subject him to various mutilations, such as blinding or cutting off ears, nose, or tongue. The goal was not only to punish the deposed ruler, but also to make them incapable of reclaiming power. Blinding especially held symbolic significance, as it not only disabled the individual, but also served as a powerful symbol of their fall from grace. By taking away their sight, the Byzantines aimed to eliminate any chance of the deposed ruler leading a rebellion or rallying supporters. Although initially effective, over the years, there were instances where mutilated rulers managed to retain some power again. As a result, the effectiveness of mutilation as a way of permanently eliminating political threats gradually declined. However, the practice persisted to some extent throughout the existence of the Byzantine Empire, indicating the lasting cultural and political significance attached to physical perfection in the context of imperial rule. The Bronze Age collapse is one of the most mysterious events in ancient history, causing widespread societal collapse and cultural upheaval in the Eastern Mediterranean and Near East. Occurring roughly from the late 12th to 11th century BCE, it led to a simultaneous decline of major civilizations like the Mysians, Hittites, and the New Kingdom of Egypt. Scholars debate its causes, considering factors such as invasions by the sea people, climate change, internal revolts, and the domino effect triggered by the fall of a major power. The Sea Peoples, a confederation of sea raiders, are often seen as key contributors to the collapse. Historical records mention their role, but their origins and motivations remain uncertain. Climate change is another factor, with the evidence suggesting environmental stress like droughts and famines that strange agricultural societies contributing to social unrest. 
The interconnectedness of ancient societies through trade networks meant disruptions in one region had widespread repercussions. The collapse of central authorities led to the breakdown of political structures causing cities to be abandoned. The Hidi capital of Hattusa, Mysian cities in Greece, and centers in the Levant all experienced dramatic declines. The Bronze Age collapse marked the end of an era, us hearing in the Iron Age with new political entities and cultures emerging in the ancient world's subsequent centuries. During the Eastern Zhou period, from 770 to 256 BCE, the Bayou, a collection of diverse ethnic groups in southern China, faced a transformative period known as the Bayou Destruction. This unfolded as Chinese states, particularly Chu, expanded their influence, assimilating Bayou communities. Residing south of the Yangtze River, the Bayou comprised various ethnicities, each with their unique languages and customs. Military campaigns by Chinese estates established garrisons and administrative centers, crucial aspects of the Bayou destruction. Cultural assimilation was significant, driven by interactions between Chinese settlers and the Bayou. Intermarriage, migration, and spread of Chinese language and customs also led to a gradual transformation. Economic integration seen in trade routes and new agricultural practices further connected the southern and northern regions. The Bayou destruction represents a complex historical process involving military conquest, cultural assimilation, and economic integrations. While the Bayou's distinctive identity faded, their impact endures in the broader narrative of China's cultural diversity and historical interactions among its ethnic groups. During South Africa's Arpithid era, spanning from the 1970s to the early 1990s, the government engaged in a secretive program to develop chemical and biological weapons for defense purposes. This covert effort included the production of nerve gases intended for potential reuse in warfare. One controversial aspect was Project Coast, overseen by Dr. Wouter Bassen, rumored to involve creating a chemical agent that could selectively target certain racial groups. Details of the project remain largely unknown due to its secretive nature. Amid increasing international pressure and the end of apartheid, President F. W. de Klerk renounced the development and possession of such weapons in the early 1990s. South Africa joined the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1995, committing to prohibiting and destroying chemical weapons. To fulfill its obligations, South Africa cooperated with international inspections, disclosing aspects of its past chemical weapons program. By 2009, the country announced the completion of destroying its declared stockpile. MK Ultra, also known as Mind Control Ultra, was a covert and controversial CIA program initiated during the early years of the Cold War in the 1950s. Lasting for over two decades, the program aimed to explore and develop mind control techniques driven by fears within the US government about the possibility of communist nations, particularly the Soviet Union and China, developing similar capabilities. The origins of MKUltra can be traced back to reports of mind control techniques supposedly employed by communist nations, prompting the CIA's interest in understanding and countering these perceived threats. The program improved a wide range of experiments with a particular focus on the use of psychoactive substances like LCD. Notably, these experiments were conducted on both willingly and unwitting patients, leading to severe psychological and physical consequences for some. The revelations about MKUltra became public in the 1970s, leading to congressional investigations, including the Church Committee and the U.S. Senate. The disclosures of MKUltra's activities sparked public outrage and prompted increased scrutiny of intelligence agencies. In 1973, CIA Director Richard Helms ordered the destruction of many MKUltra records making it difficult to fully understand the program's scope and impact. The Ainu people's history is a tragic tale of oppression and cultural destruction in Japan. As the indigenous inhabitants of northern Japan, particularly Hokkaido and parts of Russia, the Ainu have endured centuries of discrimination, forced assimilation, and the loss of the traditional lands and practices. Living distinctly through hunting, fishing, and gathering, the Ainu had their unique language, customs, and spiritual beliefs. However, during the Meiji period, which spanned from 1868 to 1912, Japan underwent rapid modernization and nationalization. The Ainu, perceived as quote-unquote backward people, became targets of assimilation policies aimed at erasing their cultural identity. The government imposed measures such as banning the Ainu language, restricting traditional practices, and encouraging intermarriage with the Japanese population. Land dispossession further contributed to the destruction of Ainu communities. The government favored Japanese settlers, gradually displacing the Ainu from their ancestral lands. Discriminating practices, appropriation of culture artifacts, and suppression of traditional Ainu expressions, including tattoos, clothing, and rituals, all played roles in eroding their cultural heritage. Although efforts have been made to recognize and preserve Ainu culture, such as the Ainu Cultural Promotion Act of 1997, the lasting impacts of historical injustices persist. Old Europe refers to pre indo european culture in Southeast Europe thriving between 5000 to 3500 BC. 
Known for advanced traits, it predates Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations. Villages achieved city-like sizes and old European metalsmiths excelled in copper and gold craftsmanship, producing over 4,700 kg of copper and 6 kg of gold. During Neolithic Europe from 7000 to 2000 BCE, communities, though varying regionally, shared characteristics such as small-scale living. Gimbutis' Kurgan hypothesis suggests invasion by nomads led to collapse, introducing violence, patriarchy, and Indo-European languages. Ethnonyms like Palas Gyand, Minonans, and Etruscans are believed to correspond to pre-Indo-European peoples. The debate between these hypotheses reflects the complexity of understanding Europe's linguistic and cultural origins, with Old Europe's archaeological legacy playing a pivotal role. The culture's achievements, intricate designs on artifacts, and evidence of advanced metalwork contribute to unraveling the nuanced history of early European civilizations. The disappearance of the Harappan civilization, also called the Indus Valley Civilization, remains a historical enigma and has intrigued archaeologists and historians for years. This ancient urban culture thrived in the Indus Valley from around 3300 BCE to 1300 BCE, but faced a gradual decline and eventual collapse. Numerous theories have been suggested to explain the civilization's downfall, yet none provide a conclusive explanation. One significant theory proposes that environmental shifts played a pivotal role. Changes in river courses, alterations in climate, or natural calamities might have disrupted the Harappan people's agricultural practices. Evidence suggests a gradual drying of the Sarasvati River, once crucial to the civilization's survival. These environmental pressures could have led to reduced agriculture output and resource scarcity. Another theory, the Aryan invasion theory from the early 20th century, suggests that a migration or invasion by Indo-Aryan groups from the northwest led to the collapse. This idea claims that newcomers with differing culture practices displaced or absorbed the Harappan populace. However, this theory lacks solid evidence and its credibility is debated. Some scholars suggest internal factors like social, political, and or economic changes might have played a role in the decline. Additionally, the possibility of widespread epidemics or diseases impacting the population has been considered. The sacking of cities, a reoccurring phenomenon throughout history, refers to the act of capturing and pillaging urban centers during times of conflict. This brutal practice has been witnessed across different civilizations and eras, often leaving a trail of destruction, suffering, and historical impact. One notable example is the sack of Rome in 410 CE by the Visigoths led by King Alaric. This event marked the first time in nearly 800 years that the city of Rome had been captured by a foreign enemy. The Visigoths, after breaching the city defensive, looted and plundered for three days. The sack of Rome had profound consequences, symbolizing the decline of the Western Roman Empire and signaling the vulnerability of even the most powerful cities. Similarly, the sack of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade is another infamous incident. Instead of targeting Muslim-controlled Jerusalem, the Crusaders diverted to Constantinople, a Christian city. The result was a violent assault on the Byzantine capital, leading to widespread looting, destruction of cultural treasures, and the establishment of a Latin Empire. In the 13th century, the Mongols, led by Genghis Khan and later his grandson Hulagu, sacked numerous cities as they expanded their empire. Baghdad, a center of Islamic civilization, fell to the Mongols in 1258. The sack of Baghdad is remembered for its brutality, with estimates suggesting the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives, and the destruction of countless culture and intellectual treasures. The sacking of cities often involved not only material loss, but also the displacement of populations and long-lasting physical trauma. The concept of city sacking was not confined to a specific time or region, as it occurred in ancient China, medieval Europe, the Middle East, and beyond. That concludes the end of the video. If you reached this far, I appreciate it, and I hope you learned something. And thank you for watching. Bye.